man. Wasn't sure what I was doing here. We have an echo because it's me. I'm the echo. Good afternoon, young people. Good afternoon to Peru. We have some Peruvians here. Fernando, how are you doing, young man? Corey Dorables, Jennifer Weaver, Jamie A. We've got a big bunch. Zen Ginger, how are you doing? So I'm looking down here because down here I have my iPad open to look at chat. Otherwise, I don't see chat. So let's just say hi to people. Um, Joey Haney, good evening. Uh, Linda Worth, some of you I um, don't recognize your name from the past. It's been about a year since the last time I live stream. Um, felt like it was time to go back going to do something a little bit different than I did uh, last time. Uh, last time it was all about conservation efforts and things we do in um, in biology, in, in the sciences to undertake conservation efforts. This time I'm going to go back all the way back to the beginning. Let's just talk about fish in general. This uh, semester at the university I'm teaching a fish biology class. So I thought, you know what, why not I give you all a little introduction to the fish and fish biology. Uh, I will be talking about um, different uh, aspects of fish. I'll be using specific examples. Like I'll, I'll be going through the way I breed discus compared to what other people, how other people breed discus. No one's right, no one's wrong. We all have different techniques. Uh, some of the other fish I breed uh, when I'm in Peru, I'll be in Peru uh, again in March. The Peruvians don't know that until right now. Yes, um, Fernando, you can tell Carlos that I will be in Peru during my Feliz Cumpleaños again. Um, so I'll probably be doing some things in Peru, showing you things around. And so that's what I plan to do. So let's get back to say... Hello to people. Hello, Sky Dancer. Uh, ABC Aquatic Biotype Creation. Yes, we're pretty much going to have an online fish biology class. Don't tell my students because they're paying good money to have this class. Um, let's see who else. I think I said hi to Kay Halliday. Not sure. Um, so, yes, those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Dr. Anthony Maserol. Uh, I wear a couple of different hats. My main hat is I'm a professor of biology and environmental studies at Soka University in America. We are a small liberal arts university in Southern California. There I teach uh, fish biology, conservation biology, um, alien invaders, which is biology, ecology of invasive species, um, I, what other course I teach, um, man, aquaculture, sustainable aquaculture, really classes related to the aquatic systems. I have taught, um, um, marine biology in the past. I worked for many, many years, um, uh, in the marine systems in the Red Sea, uh, where I worked on surgeon fishes. Not sturgeon, but surgeon with the S-U-R, surgeon fishes, migrations. And then I worked on clownfish mating and mate acquisition behavior. I like to tell people way before Nemo, way before they even thought about the movie Finding Nemo, I was working on clownfish. So I have a lot of experience. As you know, now I work in... Uh, the Peruvian Amazon, that's my second hat that I wear in that um, I am the executive director and one of the founders of the Amazon Research Center for Ornamental Fishes, after which the name of this uh, channel is named for. Um, my wife and I have been funding the research center 
for about uh, 14 years. It was started by myself, uh, Carlos Chucupiando. I know he just loves the way I says, say his last name, especially Carolina loves it. Um, and a few other people decided to buy some land uh, to build a research center in Peru. It is the only, again, the only research center in the entire world that is devoted to the ecology, biology, um, breeding, sustainable breeding practices of ornamental fishes. So we believe that one way of conserving uh, ornamental fishes uh, trying to trying to prevent the over collection of sustainable of ornamental fishes is to have sustainable breeding practices. So we are we go out to the villages, the fishing villages, and talk to them about how they can improve their catches, um, and talk to them about potential sustain. Uh, I got the sustaining on my brain uh, potential of um, breeding some of these ornamental fishes so they do not have to over collect them uh, during the collecting season and they have a um a sustainable crop all year long so i guess enough about me well i'm married great wife two step two step daughters twin daughters and four grandkids and a house full of aquaria one behind me is a uh, about a 500 gallon corner tank that's filled with uh, domestic angel fish and some tetras from Peru, Corydoras, Laura Carids, a um, bunch of fish from Peru. Uh, I built the, fish, the tank myself about 20 years ago. Let me get out of the way. It is <laughs> the front panel glass is. Um, that whole side is eight feet long, so it's eight feet long, four feet on each side, and four feet tall. So it's about 500 gallons. I've had it going up for 20 years, never have had a problem with it leaking, except one time when the bulkheads in the back started leaking. Just empty the tank. Uh, it's gone through an evolution of first was a uh, Tanganyika cichlid tank. Then it went to a total Tetra tank that was nothing but chaos. Um, decided to go to South American type. I've had wild angels with all sorts of other wild fish from Peru, uh, discus. And then most recently I decided to put the discus in the fish room and put some domestic angels as I decide what to do with the tank. So enough about me, how about you? <laughs> Um, some of you, again, I, I've seen in many of the live streams that I've been in and I go to, um, and some are new names, but like you, I'm just a hobbyist. I happen to have a PhD in zoology, um, but I've been a hobbyist since I was about nine years old. So that's over 50 years that I've been a hobbyist. And so like you, I like to learn from other hobbyists. I like to discover new fish in the hobby. I like to just look at fish. When I go to a new town, when I talk uh, all over the nation and really all over the world, one of the things I do is I like to go look at the aquarium stores just to see what fish they have. You know, each geographic area in the United States and all over the world has their particular fish that they really like. Sure, you find your bread and butter fish, your tiger barbs or guppies or um, vetas, uh, various tetras. But, you know, some areas specialize more on catfish. The people of those areas like catfish. Others like their marine fish. Uh, others like their cichlids. So, you know, each area you can find new fish that uh, you may just bring home with you. We do have a uh, marine tank in the house. That is just a little bit over here. My wife has a small 24 gallon cube uh, that's had um, clownfish in the past. Right now we have a pair of uh, seahorses uh, that the they have bred once. And unfortunately, it was when I was uh, in Peru. And so we weren't ready for them to breed. We thought they were way too early to breed. Uh, 
but in fact, they the male did release uh, a few babies. Um, we housed them in a little separate uh, breeder tank, uh, but we weren't ready for with brine shrimp, so those those babies just passed away very quickly because we didn't have anything to feed it. So right now, what we have is we have I have brine shrimp hatcheries going every day because we suspect that if they if the male is pregnant again, he should be releasing within a week or so. So we're ready this time. We're ready. In the meantime, all my fish get live brine every day and they're just loving it. Uh, in fact, I just remember right now, I put the air off the brine shrimp about a half hour ago and I forgot to feed them. So after this stream, got to go in the fish room, got to feed some brine shrimp to my baby discus and to some of the um, red pencil fish that I brought back from Peru, the full red red pencil fish. Some of the guppies I have, I, I have lots of different fish. So I just don't specialize on one fish. So I'm rambling, rambling man. Um, so let's, let's do our first lecture. Introduction to fish. Um, so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna pull up a, a, um, a, PowerPoint. There it is. Um, first thing we want to look at is really what is in a name. When when we look at the hierarchy of how things are named for any organism out there, including humans, this is the hierarchy of the naming nomenclature that we have um, in science. We have the kingdom. That's the largest grouping of what organisms fall into. So in this case, we're going to look at fish, but you can do plants, you can do um, bacteria, you can do a lot of different things, fungi, but right now we're just going to talk about fish. So the kingdom of fish, we all should know is animalia, so animal. The next slide will show all this, followed by the phylum, so there are many different phylum under the kingdom animalia. Uh, we have class, and in terms of class, then we're getting into very specific types of, of, of organisms, the fish group, the mammal group, the bird groups, the herp groups. Um, the order is more specific to what type of fish we're talking about, the family, the genus, and the species. So I'm just going to give you a, a one example of a, um, a fish, and that is the guppy. You don't need to see my face anymore. Um, and let's let's get this banner away right now. Um, let's see. Hide the banner. Okay. So we'll come back to that later. So if we look at a guppy, typical guppy, one of my favorite guppies are the sword tail guppies, whether it's a double sword tail like this or a single bottom sword tail. It's actually one of my favorite guppies. So uh, guppies belong to the phylum chordata. The well, first kingdom animalia, phylum chordata. These are things that all have a chordae or a flexible notochord. They belong in the class Actinopterygii. These are the ray finned fishes, the order Cyprinodontiforms, the family Pisaliidae. Just to give you an idea, if you ever hear a scientific word that's that's given to a fish or an animal and, and it ends in AE or DAE day, that means we're talking about the family. Um, Cyclidae is a family of fishes. Um, Tentrodontidae, uh, Ballistidae, uh, Calictidae. These are all families of fishes. So the families have all, they, they share lots of characteristics together that combines them into that one family. In the case of a guppy, we have the genus Pisalia. And when you're talking about the species, when you say, what is the species of guppies? It is Pisalia reticulata. Now, if you say, if someone asks you, what's the species of 
guppies and you say it's reticulata, that's really not correct. The name reticulata refers to what's called the specific epithet. It is kind of like your first name. Uh, but when you say what is the species of fish, you include the genus as well. In terms of the specific epithet, there may be a lot of fish and a lot of organisms for that matter that have the specific ep epithet of reticulata. That really doesn't mean much. They're not related to each other. They're just using that term reticulata because it describes the characteristic of that fish or of that organism. Uh, so, you know, they're African cichlids um, and some of the catfish, Cynodonna, there is a Cynodonna petricola, but there is also a African cichlid whose specific epithet is also petricola. So doesn't mean they're related, just means it's a similar, they have similar characteristic that they're describing in the term petricola. Okay. I hope that's clear. Uh, if it's not, just say something in chat. Again, I have the chat open on my iPad. So the chat's, you know, a couple minutes behind, but we should get, get to it. Uh, if you have questions at the end, I can answer some of the questions at the end as well. Um, so up to you guys. So let me talk about the pet peeves first. I have a lot of pet peeves for those of you know, who see me in some of the chats or see me on some of the live streams and some of the other people's uh, live streams, I do have pet peeves. It's a pet peeve because of my science. Um, many of the YouTubers, you know, they, they want to describe themselves and I, I'm not talking bad about them at all, but they want to uh, be more scientific, uh, which is great. I mean, science, um, is what makes the world go around that scientific uh, method, the observation method, uh, the, you know, the hypothesis testing. That's how we get to know things in all parts of our lives. Um, but since I come, since my background is science, I hear some things that really give me, that really cringe me out. And some of you know what some of these pet peeves are. And the first, the biggest pet peeve I have is the use of the word species versus species. Now, there is no word such as species. Um, species with the S is the plural and the singular word. So you can't say species. That is not a word. And it drives me crazy when I hear the word species. Yes, I know. I'm, you know, I, everybody said, just relax, relax. But I can't when it comes to species. It is species, not species. So remember that. You want me to yell at you? I will yell at you if you ever use the word species in front of me. I know some of you do that just because it's <laughs> funny. And so uh, I don't think it's funny. Another one is, so you don't use the word species in front of me. The other is Corridora. There's no such word as Corridora. It's a word that is made up. It's a word that's made up by people here on YouTube. You hear them say, oh, I have a new Corridora. What's a Corridora? It is Corridorus. Corridorus is a genus. You can't change the name of the genus. It's not plural or singular. It is a name. So Corydorus is the singular form. 
Maybe you can say Koryori for multiple, but I don't even know if that's accepted. You would say Koryorosis. Well, that's nothing wrong with Koryorosis. Or if you can just say Koryorus. I have many Koryorus species, but not Koryora. And I know many of my friends on YouTube will use the word Koryora and they don't like it when I correct them. Because they say, well, everybody knows what I'm talking about. That's right. Everybody knows what you're talking about. But it's wrong when you say Corridora. So Corridorus. Oh, yeah. Corridorus. Oh, okay. Everybody, I misspelled Corridorus, okay? So even I make mistakes. Dr. Awesome isn't so awesome when it comes to, to uh, typing out my slide so yes corridorus it is an a sorry 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 so i guess i shouldn't so one of my pet peeves also so i can't i can't spell very well it's that dyslexia in me that you know always rearrange words always screw up so yes corridorus corridorable corridorus a elishon a a s and again, don't say Corridorus, don't say Corridora, and I probably should put the X up here and say, don't say, don't spell Corridorus with a U. Okay, I'm a bozo. Okay, what else is new? Another thing is how people pronounce scientific names. There are some rules when it comes to scientific names. And we'll go through a few. Uh, we'll go through a few examples, and then I'll give you the rules. And we'll come back to fish and fishes at the end. So everybody knows these fish. Uh, these are Altam angels. Um, all the angel freshwater angel fish belong to a. Um, genus called pterophyllum so pterophyllum in this case the p is silent and you just say pterophyllum so if we look at the etymology of this um etymology is the origin of the word um, so it comes from two Greek words. One is teron, which means the fins or a sail, and phylum. So phylum, so they derivate phylum into phylum. It is leaf. So the fins of this fish are leaf like in appearance. But again, terra phylum. No. P um, when you say the word. Here are two other fish, tinapoma and microtinapoma. In this case, you don't say the C in the first C in tinapoma or in the microtinapoma as well. So no C. Uh, the etymology of Tina comes from uh, Greek meaning comb, and poma refers to cover. Uh, in this case, with micro Tina poma, you know they are they are small. They are much much smaller uh, than the normal Tina poma, the bush fish, the African bush fish, the African leaf fish, things of that sort. But again, CT Tino. Don't say satino or don't say microcetinopoma. It's just tinopoma. Here is one of the harder ones. So this is a uh, raccoon butterfly, raccoon butterfly fish, marine fish. So we can talk about marine fish too. Um, it belongs to the genus of ketodon. In this case, CH is 
sounded like a K. Think of chemistry. Uh, think of chameleon. You would not say chameleon. You would not say chemistry. Um, the etymology for this is uh, kita refers to the hair and odas, odon refers to teeth. So the hair are, are teeth like or their, their teeth are hair like. I don't think they have too much, too much hair on their body. So their um, teeth are hair like. But CHs are a very peculiar sound when it comes to scientific names. So if we look at another fish, this is um, a small snakehead from India, Chana Blairi. So in this case, CH is not a K sound, but a CH sound, like a typical CH sound should be. So again, why not Canna? That's just the rules of science even though sometimes the rules of science don't make sense. So let's just look at what China, Chana means. Chana comes from the Greek chane, which means anchovy or sea perch. Um, so they have the body shape of an anchovy. Uh-oh, let's see, I have one slide out of order. Yeah. So um, there be a slide out of order. So we're going to come back a little bit later to another CH that we all love. So here is GN. GN refers to, well, when you have a G and an N together, you do not say the G, you just say the N. So this is Nanolepis. And Nanolepis, in this case, this is a... Uh, Orange spotted goby. Nathos refers to the jaw, and lepis refers to scales. So the scales have a, a little teeth like um, jaw shape um, on, for them. But again, GN just is an N word. Now, this is the slide that should have been before the G word. And this is our famous polypterus. So the etymology of polypterus with the specific epithet, and I'm not going to say it right now, is that poly means a lot of, and teron, in this case, means fins. So the... Basically, the genus name refers to the fact that they have a lot of finlets on their body. So that dorsal fin is composed of many finlets that make up the fin. Now, the specific epithet actually comes from the local common name. So in this case, um, because it is a local name, it doesn't fall into the normal scientific rules um, because the local names aren't science-based. They're just based upon um, they're just based upon that local etymology. Yes, I know it's not pronounced polypterous, it's pr pronounced polyterous. Um, in this case, polypterus is a uh, acceptable name where you will say the P. Um, that's, again, science sometimes doesn't make sense. There are rules to follow when they don't. And so the common name I would I would have always been told for this fish is biker. But in fact, the local name that you that they call it in the region where this biker 
is found in is actually Bashir. So I have been saying it wrong for 30, 40 years. But in fact, this is Polypterus Bashir. So that is how they say the common name in the areas of Africa that this Polypterus is found in. So I'm a big boy. I admit when I'm wrong, I have no problems admitting when I'm wrong. Doesn't happen very often, but so for now on, I'll call this the be sheer, be sheer. So here are some of the rules to follow uh, when we're looking at scientific names. So C and CHs, when they're followed by an AE, an I, an L, a O, N, R, and U are usually spell or usually pronounced like K. But again, chemistry. How come chemistry? Where does chemistry come to play? Chemistry is followed by an E. And so in many cases, we could also include C and CH when followed by an E is not there. So C in the combination of C-A-E, C-E, C-I, C-Y, it sounded like S. So it would be say. G, it usually sounds like a G in English words such as get or Latin greasius. But when it's in the combination of G-N, as in Naphthalipus that we just looked at, the G is silent. 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 Uh, there's a group of fish called the Nathostomata. You would say, again, it's G-A-N. You do not say the G. The only G that you ever will say is in the, in the name Agnatha, which is A-G-N-A. -A. So Agnatha, so followed by the A again, which are the jawless fishes. So a when it comes in front of um, when it comes in front of a, a word normally means without doesn't have so agnathans are the jawless fish they are not without a nathom which is without a jaw so p is usually a p in like pike but in the combination of ph we all know uh, it's an f and then ph is or PT is like Taroas, which is a lionfish. Again, you don't say the P. You don't say Pateroas. You say Taroas. So I hope that makes sense to you. Print this out. Take it with you when you're trying to pronounce scientific words. And you'll sound like an expert. Now, there are a couple good books. Uh, one of the books I have in my office is Dictionary of Root Words and Combining Forms. Uh, you can actually find this on um, Amazon.com. Um, if you're in the science of naming things as your science, you're a uh, taxonomist, you probably have this uh, in your office. So when you're trying to come up with uh, a name for, especially for a specific epithet, you know you're going to want to use terms that either either describes what the fish looks like, the color of its the color of the fish, the finage. You would use the roots, uh, Greek or Latin roots, and you would find them uh, in this book. Lots of times they're named after a person. Um, Barlow eye, uh, Minkley eye, uh, you know, Coney guy named after Ad Conings. When you're going to name a fish after a person, normally you put a double I at the end or an I at the end. So there is a local tetra in Iquitos that right now it's called Tetra Carlitos, named after. Uh, our resident manager, 
So if that ever gets described, maybe it'll be named whatever genus Cardosi or Chucopiondoi or, you know, some other term that describes Carlos or maybe the location of where that fish would found, was found. So they're all going to be used as a descriptive term for that fish. So last thing I want to talk about is uh, how do you determine different species of fish? There's about 35,000 species of fish, more fish species than any other group of chordates out there, which include mammals, birds, reptiles, and amphibians. So you combine them all together. They don't, they don't amount to 35,000 fish species. In fact, you know, every year new fish species are being named, being described, being, being uh, discovered. Some were part of another species to begin with. So we have a group of, of people called the splitters who try to split apart different species, different genera into new terms. So we have fish that belong to another species to begin with that they, they decide, oh, it should be a species all to itself. Other fish species that they thought were two different species, they realize they're one species and they combine them to whatever name was the first name used in science to describe that species. So there, it, there is a determination of order to determine which is a valid species name. So traditionally what we use was morphometrics as well as meristics. Now we're getting to more the genetics. Uh, one of the things that is being used to define species is DNA barcoding. And I'll just give you a little bit of a summary of what they are, morphometrics. Well, this is just typical fish. This is a large mouth bass. Um, Mycopterus salmoides is the species name, different parts, different fins. Most fish will have all these fins. Maybe they'll have a few other fins, like in, in the case of the Bashirs, uh, they have the finlets, which just are dorsal fin that is divided up in, in many, many different parts. Uh, some fish will only have soft rays. Um, those are the more primitive fish. If, if your fish does not have any spiny rays in its fins, especially the dorsal, uh, the pelvic, the um, pectoral, and the anal fin, those are going to be the more primitive fish. The more primitive fish are like uh, trout, the salmonids. Uh, those are primitive fish. The more advanced fishes have spiny rays. So this just a typical fish, what it looks like. So morpho morphometrics are things that you can count um, on a fish. So the number of spiny rays, number of, of um, soft rays, the number of scales along the lateral line, uh, the number of scales below the lateral line, uh, diagonal um, scale rolls, number of rays in the pectoral fins, number of uh, gill arches, anything that be, can be counted is considered to be a meristic count. Um, so in the case of, of uh, typical counts for fin rays and fin spines, D refers to dorsal, P, pectoral, P2, pelvic, and then you have the anal spine. Um, Roman numerals represent spines, so spiny fins. The Arabic numbers represent the soft rays. So in this case, in a, this is, doesn't refer to this fish at all. This is just, you know, what, just to show you what they are. 
you know, so you'll have in this case, that's 18 um, hard rays and 27 soft rays. In the anal, three spiny rays, 14 soft. The pectoral, two and 12. The pelvic, one and five. And the caudal has 39 soft rays. So typically that's what you'll see in your species. Now, there may be um, some in that species that have a few more or a few less. So they'll, they'll show the, you know, it may say X, it may say, you know, 15 or 18 to 20. So that shows that there are differences within that species. And how species were delineated was whether or not you had overlap in your meristic counts. If you had complete overlap, that would mean that they're the same species. If they were diverged from each other, that means that they were probably different species. Now, morpho morphometrics um, are body ratios. So we have all these lengths that we take on the body, uh, standard length from the tip of the snout to the caudal peduncle. And the caudal peduncle is right at the base of the tail where the vertebrae stop. And so if you bend the dorsal fin, that is the caudal peduncle region. Now that is a better indication of the length of the fish than the total length. The total length is from the tip of the snout to the tip of the caudal fin. Did I say dorsal before? I'm sorry, I meant caudal fin. The reason why it's, it's a better length, the standard length than the total length is because lots of fish have their caudal fin bit off. And some fish have these long tendrils that stick out behind the caudal fin. Where do you go? You go to the end of the tendril, you go to where the fish, caudal fin should have been if it wasn't bit off. So standard length. Another that it doesn't show is fork length. Fork length is from the snout to the fork right here where the two uh, hemispheres of the caudal fin come together. So you'll take the ratio of the standard length to the total length. Take the ratio from the edge of the mouth to the top of the first uh, scale behind the head as another ratio. So all these indicate a measurement that you take and you have the ratio of the center length or the total length or the ratio of the body height to, um, you know, orbital height, orbital width all these different measurements. Um, that can be cumbersome and that can be problematic because uh, if, you know, we know that some fish are stunted in growth, so these morphometric characteristics will be off. You've all seen stunted fish where they have a huge eye and a small body, um, you know, especially in some cichlids, you can see that very easily. Well, how, how do you take a, a good morphometric characteristics from those fish? Um, so these are these are these need to be fish that you know have all the proper proportions of their body, and if it's a brand new fish that you've never seen before, that you're just trying to describe, you know how how are you going to make that determination if these are proper uh, morphometric characters on the fish? So again, can be problematic, but if you get enough of them, you get a thousand that you're measuring, all these averages should work out. And lastly, um, we look at barcoding. Uh, barcoding is a genetic sequence, a very short genetic sequence on the genetic makeup, the genome of the fish. The one that's often used for looking at uh, barcoding in fish is the um, Cohen's. I'm this 
this small part of the mitochondrial DNA. We have these little workhorses in our cells called the mitochondria. Um, and we look at the genetic sequence of the mitochondria. And in case this case, we're just looking at the CO1 area of the mitochondria. It's only uh, 1,535 base pairs long. Um, so that, that's not very long, especially when we're talking about uh, the genome size of humans as 3.2 billion base pairs. Um, and that took a number of years to, to um, get the genetic map of humans. That's what the Human Genome Project would, was based upon. Um, in this case, this, this CO1 region is only 1,535 base pairs long. So it, it was very easily determined what it is. And you're going to look at the differences in the sequences of this region of the mitochondria. And so let's, let's look at some barcoding here uh, of different uh, marine fishes. Each of these lines represents a different sequence of, of bases. So in our DNA, we have adenine, guadenine, cytosine, and thymine. And you combine three of them together to make an amino acid. And amino acids make up proteins. And that's basically what makes up our entire body. Okay, proteins, you, you build proteins. And then those from, from those proteins, you be, build structural components of the body. And so each color represents a different triplet code. And what you're trying to do is... If you have a hundred percent equivalency between two codes, and you can see in these two fishes here, the albacore tuna and the escolar, they have very similar sequences here. Here's a, there's some a few differences in this sequence here, um, here, here. So along the way, there 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 are very few differences, but there are differences, and so what that means is. They are um, different species, but very closely related to each other. And so you compare this one to the iridescent shark. You know what iridescent shark are? The uh, pangasid sharks. Um, and you can see that there are many more differences in this. So that's how you, uh, that's how you, use DNA barcoding. I know this went into more, um, you know, genetics than you want to, but this is just touched very lightly on how these new genetic techniques are used for, you know, to determine, um, determine different species, what makes up a species in fish. And lastly, just like last year, we're having a raffle. The raffle was very successful. Last year, raffle winner um, was a baker from Germany who came down and spent a week at the research center. So just like the last year, the raffle is for um, a trip to the research center we will pay up to 2000 or we'll, we'll basically pay $2,000 for a ticket. If it's you and someone else, we'll pay, pay for the first $2,000 of, of both of your tickets. Uh, and then you end up having to pay the rest. And you come and spend a week at the research center. Come work at the research center. Come work at the aquarium. Help us with research. Uh, if... Um, if you want to, we will set up uh, collecting trips for you, sustainable collecting. We work with um, exporters where they will ship your fish back to you. You pay for the shipping. You pay for all the paperwork. You must have a valid um, import-export permit if you're in the U.S. Uh, that you get from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. If you're... Um, 
from another country, then you know you have to work it out with your um, your country's wildlife specialist or wildlife uh, department at your country. So I know Europe, in the case of the EU, you have very particular um, laws that you must follow. Here in California, you can't import any piranhas. Um, Peru doesn't allow import or export of certain species. If you want to import, um, let's say, stingrays, stingrays, you need a CITES permit along with your um, import-export permit. And in the case of the, I know the southern tier states, California, Arizona, New Mexico, I believe Texas, Alabama, Georgia, and Florida, they do not allow for the importation of stingrays anyway, I believe. I'm not quite sure. I know California, no stingrays. It's illegal here in California, but not illegal in all states. So again, if you... Um, we will be having that raffle starting on March 1st. The raffle is done through a company called Network for Good. So it's all on the up and up. They handle all the money. They handle everything. And what we'll do is um, for how many tickets you buy, we'll put your name on the wheel, the wheel of chance. And it's going to be done totally by random. Um, the more tickets you buy, the more chances you have. I believe last year we had 110, um, 110 entries into the raffle. The raffle last year were $50 each. Um, and I don't think there's no reason for the raffle to be any more expensive than $50. Um, we try to make our money back at least. Um, because we, we do pay for everything while you're in the country. We pay for your food, your housing. You'll, you'll be staying at the research center. Uh, we pay for all your transportation costs while you're in the country to get to different collecting sites. We pay for the boat. Uh, we pay for the, the guide. We, we hire one of the local fishermen to take you out uh, to go collecting. Uh, so all these things add up. Uh, you know, we... We really don't make much, if any, money off it, but it's just an opportunity for us to to show the hobbyists what we do there. Um, so it'll be announced just the week before April or March 1st, and then we'll be doing the, the Will of Chance on the April 5th live stream uh, right here after um after i do whatever i do to do that day if we right now I'm, i i think i'm at uh 600 and something um subscribers um you know i'm not here to get subscribers i'm not here to make money off youtube i'm here to give information to people but by the time we do the raffle or a couple weeks before they do the raffle if we get up to 750 subscribers, I will um, put everybody's name in a hat and I will um, have a drawing on my live stream for a free ticket to the raffle. So, I'm, you know, that's going to be unannounced. It's just whenever I hit 750, it'll happen. Um, you know, I know people... I've been in live streams where normally the people get, uh, you know, let's say 50, 60, 70 people into their live stream. But when they announce a raffle, they get 200 people in their live stream. I, you know, I, I want to do this organically. I don't want people just to show up because there's a raffle. It's great for people to show up. It's great for people to, to subscribe to the channel. Uh, but I'm, you know, I want to have people who are more interested in the content more interested in seeing my beautiful face, my wonderful voice, the great information that you're going to get on this channel. 
hopefully it's, you know, there's so many channels. I'm sure I am duplicating what someone else is doing, but they don't do it my same style. You know, I got a style. My students say I have a style. They don't like my style, but I have a style. Um, so I appreciate um, everybody being here. If you have any questions, because I know, well, we have plenty. Brianna is doing a stream. She normally does a stream at um, two o'clock uh, Pacific time. Um, so we have time before her stream. So I know there's been some questions um, that have come up in the, um, in the uh, live stream. So uh, if anybody has any questions, I know Corey Dorable asked about Corridor Sri, which is the, one of the Corridoris species from Peru that uh, she was able to get from me because um, I do import fish from Peru usually twice a year. Um, and so, you know, that's a word that uh, is a local word. Uh, some of the locals say Chiri with a C-H. Some just say Chiri. Um, I just call it the big old corridor from Rio Nanai. Uh, so it's really one of those terms that the locals call it one thing and we want to call it something else. Yeah, Chiri, Chiri. Um, as it said, Mambuna or Mbuna. It's actually, I've heard it pronounced both by scientists. Mambuna is what you know, normally I hear it called, uh, but I do hear it called Buna by some people. But Mabuna is the normal, um, normal pronunciation of those African cichlids. So, you know, is it tomato or tomato? Yes, so the M is pronounced. You're right, Alishon. Um, you can, um, let's see, go to a banner. This is the Research Center's email. This is not the email that is associated with um, the um, this YouTube channel. Um, the... You can reach me there or at this um, email, which is the email associated with YouTube. Um, so here is that one, Amazon Research Center at gmail.com. Um, email me. Give me suggestions of what you'd like to see. Um, give me suggestions of, you know, if you would, if, if there's some expert that you would like me to bring on, uh, I'm, you know, I, I'm not opposed to bringing on people to my live stream. I don't have all the answers. I surely don't have all the answers for sure. I know the fish that I know. I don't know all fish. I have bred many, many different species of fish, or shall I say, I've had many species of fish breed for me without me doing much. Does that make me an expert in breeding those fish? Surely not. Um, you know, fish will breed just because they'll breed if, if the conditions are correct. Even by accident, they'll breed. Um, so just because I've bred a fish doesn't necessarily mean I know how to breed those fish. Um, so I'm, I, you know, you're, especially some of these specialized fish. I'm not an African cichlid person. I've had Tanganyikans before in my big tank behind me. They bred like, you know, rabbits just because they had a lot of hidey holes to hide from. Uh, does that mean I'm an expert at breeding Tanganyikas? Not at all. You know, I, and like most of you, I'm not in the business. I give more fish away than I sell. I sell fish for a lot less than they're worth. And I sell fish for a lot less than they cost me. That's why I'm in science. That's why I'm not a business person. If I was in business, I'd be in the poor house because I'm, I'm not a very good business person. And I, I've known that. So that's why I don't do business. That's my wife is, that's why my wife is in charge of the money at the research center. She determines when and how and where and how much we spend. So, you know, I'm a scientist. 
Also, last thing I want to say about is the at the research center. Uh, if you go to our webpage and you're interested in coming down to Peru, uh, working as a volunteer, or if you know college students who are interested in this subject area and want to do an internship, we do have internships and volunteer uh, ships available at the research center all year long. Uh, but for most students, they want to come down in the summer. Um, there is a tab on the um, on the web page called uh, volunteer or internships. I don't remember now. You know, I have to um, uh, I have to look at it myself. If someone can look at it, that'd be great. Um, I just realized that we do not have any um, mods. I guess when I started the new channel, I didn't switch over mods. So if you're interested in being a mod, uh, please met, let me know. Uh, you know, mods are there to put in links if I ask for links or if there's, you know, lurkers who are uh, putting in not too good comments to delete those. I'd appreciate it. Uh, just email me and I will uh, make you a mod. Um, if not, Y'all can enjoy it. So, again, any last minute questions uh, before we leave? Oh, yeah, your email address has a G in it. Yes, it does have a G in it. At what would that be? At Gmail? It would be at mail.com. That's right. You don't pronounce the G in mail. So, it's Amazon Research Center at mail.com, but you spell it with a G or amaze at amazonresearchcenter.org is the other one that comes directly. And I have a third email, which is my university email. You want to email me at my university? You can do that as well. So again, internships, volunteerships are available. We ask for only a minimum of three weeks stay because if we want to train you, have you do your stuff. And plus you have to pay for your own plane ticket It'd be worth your time to be there longer. Now, if you can't be there longer, email me anyway and see if we can arrange something out. So especially for you, those of you who work for a living, unlike me, a college professor who doesn't work for a living, has all summers off to do my research and go down to Peru. Uh, I know it may be difficult for you to take three weeks off when you only get two weeks off a year. So I understand that. So uh, email me if need be at... Uh, the research center or the Gmail, and we'll see if we can work something out. Um, and raffle, 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 raffle. Oh, no, see, let's see. Amazon Research Center. And, okay, Amazon. Matt. I'm confused. I'm confused, Matt. No center. You put a G in it. I'm going through everything. A maze at Amazon Research Center.org. Amazon. Oh, gotcha. Now I see it. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Create a manner. Thank you. Amazon. Research Center. I was trying to write it uh, really fast at gmail.com. Yes. Oh, no. That, I spelled Mickle. Okay. Is that right now? Amazon Research. Gee whiz. I got the wrong one. Amazon Research Center at gmail.com. Let me let me delete that one. Thank you, Matt, for for pointing that out. Okay. Again, thank you very much, everybody. Have a good day. See you next Wednesday on All Things Fish. Oh, fish and fishes.
That's right. Fish and fishes. Both are proper. Fish is used uh, when there are five fish of the same species. You have five guppies. That is fish as plural and singular. If you have five guppies and one Corydoras catfish, you say you have fishes. So fishes refer to more than one species of fish. So fish is a singular plural word that you use when you have the same species. Yes. Sorry about that. That was one. Thank you all. You have a good day. Hasta la vista, Fernandito. Uh, tell everybody at the research center, I said, hola, como esta? To all of you, have a good week. Hug your family. Do your water changes. And hopefully I'll see you next week. So thank you very much.